Thank you for coming out. I know obviously it's a bit of a shitty night. I've already got it in the ear from the missus. She's like, you should have called this off. Like, and I was like, well, I didn't know. And I thought yesterday would have been, or this morning would have been snowed, but it wasn't. So um, obviously we have a host of questions. I'll just try and run through this really quickly then just hopefully answer stuff that is important and specific to you guys. Um, this is a little bit different. So anybody who's been with us for a few years will know how much I love nutrition and how much I harp on about it and talk about it. Um, and this is one of my slightly different nutrition talks because one of the ones I've done before, dietary interventions for fat loss, um, you know, basically trying to highlight points, primarily focused on fat loss. Today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about fat loss, but obviously I wanna talk about uh, some of the gaps that you're probably missing because when you always see the mainstream marketing for, um, gyms and fitness programs, it's all about how you're going to feel after the program. You're going to be more energized, you're going to feel stronger, you're going to feel fitter, you're going to have more body confidence. Um, and I think a lot of the times we look for this perfection. Um, we're looking for what is the, the perfect diet, what is the perfect recipe for recovery or whatever it may be. Um, and when we talk about optimizing, there's a big word in the fitness industry, especially around like fitness professionals is, what is optimal and what is not, right? And it tends to almost sound like black or white. So it's either, oh, that's not optimal. But because it's not optimal doesn't mean that it's not good, okay? You could be on that path. And the reason why I did this is, when we work with clients, especially people who come through the door, some people have no background in nutrition, some people have a little bit of knowledge and so forth. Um, and sometimes you try to optimize, you just try and improve their nutrition rather than going, what the old school was is just give them a piece of paper, tell them to follow it. When they couldn't follow it after a while, then blame them. Um, and we know, and, it, and I find myself talking to people more and more and say, listen, we have these meal plans, we have these recipe guides, but I'm gonna coach you on it week by week because this week we may focus on protein. How are we gonna bring your protein intake up? Here's a couple of simple things that I want you to do. Um, and I, I think the main theme for me now, because people will understand I talk a lot about psychology and like we've more information now than we ever have of getting people results or getting in shape or building muscle or doing all these things. And we don't do it. <laughs> um, and sometimes we just need to be obviously in the right frame of mind. We need to be motivated. Uh, we need to be goal oriented, but everybody's different. And what I want this to be, and what I try and focus on with people now is to be client centered, person centered, um, so that if I have a client who is 25 stone and has got down to 13, 14 stone, and I say to him, sorry, uh, you need to eat more, I need to understand how that's going to affect him because he's going to think, oh, if I eat more, I'm going to put on weight. You know, it's not a case of black or white going, you know, just do this and it'll work. You know, I've probably spoke to a few people in here and said, just do this. It's a lot harder than that. Um, so obviously, uh, welcome, like I said. Um, if you came here looking for magic hacks, tricks, potions, or seven minute abs, then you're probably going to be disappointed. Uh, I'm not here to sell bullshit. I'm just here to try and put the information together, uh, improve your level of knowledge, and maybe something here will click. I understand human psyche again. When I go to a seminar, there's something that will really interest me, and that's what I really want to hear about. Um, all I'll ask is try and keep an open mind because if I was to do this, 10 times over the next 10 weeks, you would pick up something different every single time, even from the same talk. Um, and the best way that was explained to me is you're at a level to re receive certain information and once you learn that and implement it, then you're almost ready for the next stage, okay? Um, so for you guys, what does is, what is optimizing your nutrition mean? Just shout out a few things. What do you think it means to you? I'll start picking people. Okay. So fat loss, it means improving your muscle mass. Yeah. In terms of? Yeah. Well, like, if you improve your muscle mass, is that going to improve your health? Yeah, it's going to improve your metabolic rate. It's going to help you, um, you know, have a higher uh, caloric intake. It's going to help you in terms of uh, not suffering from osteoporosis and all these things. So, yeah, um, th there's different reasons. That's a fat loss reason. It could be a performance reason. 
Uh, so I've worked with people who, you know, have competed in, say, endurance sports, whether it's triathlon, whether it's uh, marathons. Uh, I've had faders, boxers, MMA guys, and obviously what they eat and what they put in their body matters. Okay, you obviously have soccer players, Gaelic, uh, rugby, and so you might need to focus on what's going to actually improve them. Um, and then sometimes there's a fan balance between, you know, maybe you're coming off a pre-season and you're like, oh, I'm carrying a bit of weight. I want to lose weight. But you're going to pre-season. It's probably not, probably is the best time, but, you know, you want to get to the point where you're fit and healthy for that season. I'm just thinking about a sport. So optimizing nutrition is um, a few things. Right. And for me, this is what it means. And I, I mentioned it earlier. You don't have to be perfect. Right. I think hopefully mainstream uh, is starting to promote this a little bit more that, listen, there is nobody who's perfect. Nobody's going to have the best diet. Nobody's going to um, be perfect 100 percent of the time. And if we apply this perfection syndrome, this Instagram filter to everything that we do, it tends to just sort of put your head away. Um, and then that's probably going to cause you more problems because you're holding yourself to a standard that is unachievable or in reality is not really real for most people. Uh, you just simply have to be better. You know, being better each day, we have it on our wall, you know, work harder than you did yesterday. Um, you know, if you worked on something that week and it improved, you know, what are you going to work on this week and so forth? And it's, I don't want to be philosophical and all stoic and shit, but like realistically, that's all that life is. Life is either growth or decline. There is no maintenance. That's the same with the human body, okay? Oh, shit, sorry. Uh, So uh, this is something I, I try and teach to clients, to students, anybody who's come through the academy. This is, for me, what everybody should be focusing on, right? We have three realms here. We have body composition, we have performance, we have health. If you focus on one thing, you might lose one or two other things. So for example, if I focus purely on body composition, give you 1,200 calories, get you to do cardio every single day, you know, you might be skinny, you might get you a, a body fat percentage or a body composition that you want, but I can guarantee your health's going to deteriorate and performance going to deteriorate, right? And the problem we have is that this is being portrayed as the holy grail. And then what happens is for a female who's really underweight, who may be at a certain body composition, they start to develop an amenorrhea, they're not having periods anymore, um, you know, they're not taking in fat-soluble vitamins, all the things that they need for their sort of androgen hormones, and then our health starts to deteriorate. Now, we can go for performance, and we can say, you know, we can carb load on a Friday night because we're going to play a football game or a rugby game on a Saturday. We may be overweight. Like, the example I always use is, you can still see a guy playing a Sunday league game with a beer belly because it's not about body composition there. Yes, body composition would health or help. And the last time I did a seminar for a uh, Gaelic team, we talked about what, a, what it takes to be an elite level player in terms of physical attributes, where their body composition should be at, where their speed should be at, like the things. So I always tell people, if you aim for that, forget about the talent, yes, Talent will separate people, but the Coach Carter type mentality of anybody seen that film, if you work hard enough, then you're going to be able to compete. And then obviously that talent may be the difference. Um, and then obviously you can eat for health. You can eat all the healthiest things in the world, get plenty of fruit and veg, vegetables, lots of phytonutrients, vitamins, minerals, proteins, carbs, and you can be overweight. And this is something that we're all learning now because you're like, oh, shit, I've been eating salads and nothing's happening. Okay, so I think that that sweet spot is somewhere in here. And what I will say is, if you want, if you want a certain look, right, if you're willing to go to the extremes to do photo shoots or uh, like shows and stuff like that, these things will, will suffer, right? Let's be realistic. There is no perfect scenario where you're going to get a super level, low level of body fat, and these things are not going to be impacted. Because when people go to me, oh, how do you get into shape for a photo shoot or whatever it is? Those people are actually, in my mind, stupid, right? 
Um, they have such a desire to do something that they are just like highly motivated. So they're the easiest people to coach. If you tell them, I need to do 45 minutes of cardio every day, they'll do it. You know, we're, most of us are, are people who only maybe train three, four days a week, train recreationally. We obviously want to have a life as well. I want to be able to enjoy a beer, have some food. But we also, you know, we think that we should have six pack abs. I and mean, it's like, it's really, really overrated. Like for me now, I look back when I was 20, 21 going, fuck, I should be in the shape I was then. And I'm like, but I enjoy, I enjoy eating. Enjoy food, do you know, enjoy dinner. So priorities um, will matter. And, and then obviously if you're performing for a sport, you know, those two things can go hand in hand, okay? Um, the, the basic thing that we always see in this hierarchy, and you'll see a lot of people talk about this, is that calories, macronutrients, sleep, micronutrients, uh, meal timing, like there's sometimes in different orders for different people, right? Um, and what the probably ascending order that I like to follow is there should be another base here and the base should be adherence, right? Being able to follow what it is that you're doing, okay? So for example, I could give you 2,000 calories, give you a keto diet where it's high fat, low carbs, but you love carbs. So you're going to struggle in the long term. And you're just doing this in the short term to get an initial response. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and what we're going to talk about is that we don't really have a weight loss problem in this world. We have a weight maintain problem. And we also have a weight gain problem. Because from, I think, I'm not sure when the sugar tax was here. It was maybe 2014, I want to have them ahead. Um, and the sugar intake in the UK and up here has been reduced by 18%, but obesity is still rising. No country in this world has managed to tackle obesity. It's still a, a, a problem, right? Somebody says to me, what about Japan? I say, Japan still have heavy people. You know, they, they have a healthier typical diet. The same with the Mediterranean diet. It's one of the healthiest diets, but it doesn't mean that they're immune to obesity, okay? Um, and this is what tends to happen, okay? Before, oh, we're like, yep, want to lose a little bit of weight. That's going to be amazing. And then we get to that weight, and then what happens to the after, after? Okay, so all diets that we do will work as long as they put you into a caloric deficit. I'm sure you may have heard that before. And caloric deficit, I think, is a big buzzword, and I'm not sure a lot of people understand it when, they, when people talk about it, because it's just like, right, that sounds great, but like, what does it mean? Um, so, like I said, everyone has lost weight in the past. Everyone has been able to achieve a goal like that. The problem is just maintaining it, okay? Um, and what happens is if we don't maintain it, if we don't maintain what got us there, it'll tend to be what takes us back, okay? So the example I always use for people is, you know, this point here can be known as your set point. It can be known as your maintenance as well for calories, if we're looking at it like that, our body fat percentage, like, our body has a natural weight where it feels comfortable to sit at, okay? And it can adapt over time. So for example, if I have someone who's sitting at 12 stone and they want to be 10 stone, you know, in order for them to get down to say 10 stone here, they're going to need to do a few things, okay? They're probably going to have to eat a little bit less. They're probably going to have to exercise to get to this point. But say if this person has trained three times a week has been on a calorie deficit of about 15 to 20% by the end of this, and they get to that golden 10 stone mark they want to get to. What do you think is going to keep them there? Yeah, but that's boring as shit, isn't it? You don't want to be doing the same thing your whole life. And we're going to talk about reverse that and, and basically how we can lock in our results because I primarily think with all the clients I work with, 95% of them I talk to them about reverse that and which is eating more. Um, so to get to that 10 stone mark, we want to slowly increase those calories and get back to a new set point of 10 stone, but that takes time for your body to adapt. It doesn't just go, oh, I accept this new weight because realistically you've starved it for a period of time. And then what will happen is if you stop doing those things, you end up not only back to where you were, but you tend to add an extra five to 10% on top. Hence why when we look back at the real story, 
if it goes, oh. Yeah, it'll go through here, sorry. When you've seen the before, you've seen the after, and you've seen the after after where they got heavier. That's the thing that we need to focus on because if not, and I, I do this all the time for anybody who has spoke to me about nutrition, they will tell you that I'm very focused on telling people when to stop dieting. Listen, enough is enough. You need to think about what's going to happen next because as you can see here, this after, after. And, and the average person puts on about two kilos a year. Right, one to two kilos a year, we're, we're adding to our own body composition unless we've got exercise. But managing that weight gain is, is, is a big thing, okay? So, like I said, we don't have a weight loss problem, we have a weight loss maintenance problem. Um, and there's, I'm just gonna cover a few basic things because I haven't put a huge amount in for fat loss because I wanna I want answer most of these questions, which are probably even gonna be more important. But there's two laws in thermodynamics, right? And the first one is that energy can be transformed, so it can be from one form to another, but it cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change forms, okay? So basically what that means is I have food, I eat that food, and my body transforms the energy from that food into what I can use, which is ATP, like, which is the currency for the body, okay? We can't just wake up in the morning after starving ourselves for a week and expect our body to have energy. Now, if it has stored energy, we can utilize that, but we can't get blood from a stone. And there's the debate of, oh, I do fasted cardio, I wake up, I don't eat anything, and then I go running, that's gonna burn more fat. It won't burn more fat if you eat more calories that day, because your body will just go, oh, hey, so those extra calories that we burned this morning, just store them again. Okay, and I'll talk about some of those things as well. So it's important to realize that what we do and what we transfer is super important. Uh, and pretty much all the calories that we have throughout the day can come through this. I'm sure some of you may have heard of BMR or RMR, your basal metabolic rate or your resting metabolic rate. And basically that's just the amount of calories your body needs to function, right? So to, you know, for you to blink, for you to uh, digest food, for you to, um, you know, literally get all the, the organs function, even breathing, okay? And some of the other things we have are thermic effect of meals, neat, and exercise. So exercise is such a small component. When I have somebody comes and trains with us for three hours a week, it's the other outside of here that matters the most. And that's the hard thing because we can't control that for the most part. Um, and it will come down to decisions. And like Claire, what you were saying, there was something I used to do all the time, which was a social support questioner, which was asking people the question of, do you have a support network? It obviously wasn't as simple as that, but there was loads of list of questions of, does your partner eat junk in front of you? Does this happen? Does that happen? Blah, blah, blah. And it gives you a score. And you would be surprised at the amount of people do not have the support network necessary to transform their body or even maintain their results. And a lot of the time that's, the person who's trying to change, it's their fault. And the reason why it's their fault is because they haven't set the boundary in place, right? Imagine my partner loves having a takeaway on a Saturday night and I suddenly decide to sign up for a six week program, right? She may just act, or he, depending on my preference, uh, may just act in the way that they have always acted, right? So it's not their fault, they, they don't know what's going on. So I need to say, listen, hey, uh, I'm doing this thing, I'd appreciate your support, um, can you do it? And usually most people are like, yeah, could. I actually had one couple, the guy, uh, his partner had said to, to him about it. And so he had his bars of chocolate in the car. So when she got in the car, she found all these wrappers. Because you can keep that away from him and obviously it'll help. So I actually say it's just a small part. And the things that we can only control are these. Okay, NEAT stands for non-exercise. So basically anything you do day to day, you obviously hear the old adage of, you know, if you're in a, an office and you're sitting down, you're not burning a huge amount of calories and so forth, which is true. Um, but we want to try and be as active as possible. One of the reasons why I got a dog. So I had a responsibility, I had to go out, have to walk, uh, walk them every day. Um, and what that last slide just translates into is we put food in our body and the food is obviously different forms of protein, carbs, fats, fibers, everything else. And what we get from that food, if you think of that thermodynamics, that energy, we get our rest and metabolic rates, so the calories you need for our body to function. We get movement, 
and we get thermic effect of food, okay? So that's what happens when we put the food in and that's what we get out. Um, this is Bob. So the, the, the way I always explain this is Bob eats five burgers and he burns four burgers off. There's obviously an extra burger that's gonna be stored, right? That tends to happen, okay? So people just think because they eat 5,000 calories on a Saturday night that it just doesn't go somewhere or they panic the next day and think they suddenly put on weight. We cannot put on body fat, I'll, I'll choose my words correctly, um, in a, such a short space of time. It, it doesn't work like that, okay? Because we could have someone who, and we'll talk about this, imagine their maintenance calories is 2,000 throughout the day and, you know, maybe they eat 1,000, then the next day they eat 3,000, the next day they eat 2,000, by Thursday, you may find that that person's weight is actually still the same. Yes, you know, the day after they add that thousand, they're down in weight. The next day after they eat 3,000, they go up. And then the day after, it could be a balance, okay? And this is why we get these massive weight fluctuations all the time. Um, so just to cover some of the, the basic stuff, you know, for most people, I've probably done this in a lot of detail. I'm sure you're familiar with this. I'm not going to say that you don't know this because I think most people are, are clued in now of, of what they want. But we know protein is important, growth tissues, all this sort of stuff. When I'm speaking to females especially about it, I'm trying to make it something that, that is important to them and, and it's always hard because they tend to gravitate more towards carbs, is if you want nice hair, you want nice skin, you want nice nails, don't take me as a representation. Uh, eat more protein will help you lose your hair, but um, it, it's important, okay? We need it. Uh, it's a vital macronutrient, right? Um, and obviously, there's different forms. A complete uh, amino acid profile would obviously come from something like meat and dairy. Um, what was usually disregarded was veggie protein and alternative forms of protein. And now we know, a bit like the body, it just recognizes protein, regardless of whether it's a plant-based source or whether it's a meat-based source. Yes, there is, you know, different amino acids, different things that we have there, but we can make them up by having a varied diet, okay? Um, and one of the most important things here is obviously, how much protein should you be getting? Okay, and it will differ per person. Um, and again, this is why I wanted to look at this from a, an optimize, like improve, when we're looking at body weights of, you know, maybe 70 to below, you're probably gonna typically think that that's more of a female, um, not, not that it can't be a male or so forth. I know some of the higher weights can be a male or a female. And if we look at the lower end of how much protein this person should be having, for somebody who's 45 kilos, 100 pounds, 36 grams, 54, 72, 90, right? As we move up the scale, and this is what would be recommended, especially for meals, for a starting point for strength and essentially maybe fat loss. Because what tends to happen is we get so infatuated with protein thinking it's class, right? And it is great, but we give it such a, you know, we put it on a pedestal at that point where it can only do so much. And what I mean by that is, if I tell someone, you know, you should be having, you know, 150 grams of protein a day, they may assume that 200 would be better. There is a point of, you can only get so much out of it. So for example, we're all familiar with like the, the film, some, maybe young, some young people here, Fast and Furious. Yeah, I think it was one of the first ones. Vin Diesel has like this wee nitric oxide button. And when he's in a race, he push it, and he literally just takes off, right? So in every race, or if he's just racing consistently, why doesn't he just keep pressing that button on the car? Anybody know? It what? It runs, out. it runs out. The same thing happens with muscle growth in the human body. See, once you press that big button, right, to go, I want to grow muscle tissue or I want to improve, right? The physiology books will say that you can only do that for about four to six hours, right? And then once that wears off, once those proteins in your body are utilized, then four to six hours later, you can push that button again. But there has to be a point. You can't just go, you know what? I'll eat a little bit of protein, that'll be great. 
Well, see if I had a Nando's full chicken, that would be better. It would just be overkill. Because see those excess calories? We can't store them, but they can be used for energy. So if you overeat on protein, it's still going to be converted into energy. Right? So you just want to be careful with how much you take in. And a lot of people that work with me are surprised at how, not how little um, I give them protein waste, but I give them a starting point, a baseline, so that we can either go up if we need to. Whereas if I have someone, there was a girl I trained on a Tuesday morning and a Saturday, a girl she needed. So she's came through our academy. Um, she's a personal trainer herself. She weighs at the minute 64 kilos. She came to me, she was eating 220 grams of protein a day. Seeing, we can have some dudes eating, lifting, or eating that, right? Most of it all just like regulated. But it was overkill because then she's missing out on huge opportunities of carbohydrates and fats for energy, for performance, and to get better. And that's what she wanted. She wanted to grow. Okay. So I want us to look at this as a sliding scale because most people may come in and they may be in around this range. And if I can get you to here, that's going to improve your body composition and your performance and so forth. And then obviously to where you want. Because for me, optimizing nutrition can, can encompass a few things. You can be getting results, right? Uh, I'm going to use this as a... I'm going to say that's a bathtub, <laughs> okay? Right? The water could be leaking out of the bathtub. You could still be getting results in the gym. You could still be improving. But if you don't plug that hole soon enough, there's going to be no water left, right? Um, and for some people, optimizing their nutrition is focusing on what this is. So for that, that could be somebody who has a chronic illness. That could be somebody who has a nutrient deficiency. That could be somebody who is not eating enough, right? Because that's the thing that can take their performance up that little bit more. And I constantly look at this. If you find something that works for you, amazing. But then in my brain, I'm going, but can it be better? Right? Yeah. That's where then you have that balancing act between carbs, fats, and protein. So obviously, as you say, you have a certain amount of calories to play with. And Orla mentioned earlier about not wanting to take supplements, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there's some things that we that are manufactured that have a lower calorie. Like you were saying about food volume. Like protein is obviously going to provide more satiety, help you feel full. Nobody's sitting there after eating a steak for breakfast and going to want another steak. You know what I mean? So there's a satiety element to that. But in terms of maintaining it, you're going to have to sacrifice something else. And it's usually, from a body composition perspective, most people will sacrifice fats. Um, because what will happen is they're twice the amount of calories that the protein is or carbs are. So you probably have to eat shit and nutrients to If you're talking about eating 1,200, I'm not saying that you are, but if you're talking about eating 1,200 calories, you have to be so selective with your food choice. You know, I, I explain it a little like, uh, a bit like shopping. You know, if you have a small budget to work with, you're not going to go and shop Marxies. Do you know what I mean? You're looking for all these and littles. You're looking for the best value. And that's really what you're doing with your food. It's like, oh, if I have this, that's going to set me back and now I need to regulate and, and do what I'm doing forward. Um, and the reason why I wanted to bring that protein slide and scale up is if you eat on the lower end of that scale, you're more likely to have a moderate to high body fat, right? You're more likely to, you know, be in a caloric surplus because you don't have something that is satiating. Now, if you're on the higher end of this, you're more likely to be exercising, training, wanting to build muscle tissue, trying to maintain muscle tissue, trying to lose body fat, and you're more likely to be in a better health and body composition position. Okay, so eating more protein does serve you. I don't want you to say that, like, this is why there's a scale, because if you're an elite level athlete, say you're an endurance runner, protein's not as important. If you're an Olympic lifter or you're a power lifter, then protein becomes even more important. So it depends on the devil on the dose. Um, and in terms of when we should eat our protein, it should be throughout the day. So this study here from Arteta, not the Arsenal manager, um, basically 
give uh, two groups of people, or sorry, um, three groups of people, 80 grams of protein, one group at 20 grams and four feedings, the other group at two meals of 40 grams of protein, and another group had eight meals with 10 grams in it. Okay, so it all equates to 80 grams of protein, but what they found was just having a little bit of protein in each meal was, was super important. Now the problem we have is, and I, I talk about this a lot, is the cultural habits that we have, right? We, we tend to eat cereals, we tend to eat like carbohydrates for breakfast, not a lot of us eat proteins for breakfast. We might, if we're lucky, might have protein for lunch, but we'll definitely have meat spuds like, we'll, we'll definitely have a meat source in the evening. And again, all those habits have been learned from generations before us, parents who are maybe, you know, looking at it from a perspective of money saving. Protein costs more money. We tend to follow the habits. The, the best one I always say is the, you know, the takeaway on a Saturday night. We were born and raised on those. So now they've suddenly moved from a Saturday night to, well, I can have a takeaway on a Tuesday, have one on a Thursday. You can have it whenever you want. Um, so those eating habits and cultural habits are important as well. So protein ways, you obviously want to mix that up throughout the day. And then obviously in terms of dietary fat, um, we were told from a study in the 60s that fat and saturated fat was bad for us. It clogged our arteries, it caused heart disease, uh, cardiorespiratory disease. And then as the years have went on, we realized that it is a certain type of fat that causes that. And do you know what improves your risk of not having those things? Being in a healthy body composition and a healthy BMI, right? Because if you improve your body composition, all your health markers improve. Right? That's one of the amazing things about getting into shape, getting fitter, getting stronger. Okay? But the average person should be having somewhere between 20 to 35% of their total calories coming from fats. Okay? If you don't want to end up like this. So if you have 10%, if you're lower and you're on the low end, because I have a, have a female who is doing the PT course at the minute and she's an endurance runner and she is dangerously low. Um, like she stopped having periods, she has no cycles, like energy's in the hole. Uh, and I'm just sort of explaining to her, like, if we can bring that up, you'll see an increase in your performance, you'll see an increase in your running times, um, probably changes to your body composition because she's not giving herself enough to recover. But if she follows that low-fat diet for ages, then obviously all her androgens, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, all these things are going to drop, okay? Her, the receptor density just basically means the ability for our body to, you know, um, accept those. And then our fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. I think the, the, the best thing that came out of COVID was the fact that people respected vitamin D even more and the effect that it had on us and the fact that we don't get a lot of sunlight here. And a lot of people then started to supplement with that, okay? The problem is if you're not getting enough fat, you don't get those vitamins and minerals. If you don't get your vitamins and minerals from those, of course you're going to have a nutrient deficiency. That's going to affect your sleep, your performance, energy. And remember, if we think back to when we're selling these programs of getting people in, they want the outcome of better energy, better performance, better body composition. You, you want that? Uh, so there's three different types. So there's monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, saturated, right? So you're talking for monounsaturated, you're talking at like certain nuts, you're talking olive oils, you're talking polyunsaturated, you're talking fish oils, you're talking um, some vegetable oils. And then when you're talking about saturated fat, you've got like animal meat, or you've got like coconut oil, butter, stuff like that, okay? Well, I see what you say about um, the, the proteins kind of taken over the course of the day. Yeah. I would eat mine probably more lunch, the evening would be my biggest intake. Would you say that that? See, see, all that'll tell you. All that'll tell you is that's the most optimal way. See, even if you went and you did two two bits of forty. See, by the end of the day, when your body's uh, your body's catching up that register, that's still going to be good. Yeah. Then not doing it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, if you could spread it out, that would be amazing. That would be more beneficial to you. But Laurie mentioned something about fasting. So intermittent fasting is something that's became really popularized. And it's been popularized 
not only on the body composition, but the health benefits that come from it. The health benefits are called, are, some people pronounce it different, but it's called autophagy or autophagy. And basically all that means is cell cleansing and cell regeneration, right? So it basically means that when you're not eating, your body's focusing on repairing itself. So if you have somebody who maybe suffers from IBS, right, or has an IBD, like an herbal bowel disease, Crohn's, colitis, uh, whatever it may be, they will enjoy a, an intermittent fast diet because they're not eating the foods that are affecting their gut, okay? And that's a bigger problem. We're gonna talk about gut health here as well today. But yeah, if you can spread that out, it'd be better, but it's, it's not, better than not. And then would you, are you still eating within your calorie range? Yeah, yeah, I'm still eating within the calorie range. Yeah. I'm still getting the protein in it, but I'm just wondering, would it have been better? Well, obviously, ideally, it's better to eat three or more at different times, but would it make much of a difference if you're going to eat more at the time rather than spreading that out? You know? I think the higher you go in terms of what you want to achieve, the more specific yeah, okay. and narrower you need to be. Because the advice that's given generally is, as long as you hit your calories and hit your protein, you're grand. Doesn't matter when you get them, which is the, a great starting point. Yeah. For me, especially when I work with females, I, I also try and add carbs in there and try and be consistent because that you guys are most likely to fluctuate every day. And the biggest reason why people stop on their weight loss journey, fat loss journey, or performance journey is when they see weight fluctuations. Do you imagine you've been great all week? And then comes the Saturday and that's your weigh-in day and it's slightly elevated because of the time of the month or whatever it is or you've had more ca carbs the night before, then you're just going to yourself, what the, what the fuck's the point? Bust my balls all week and didn't see any results when in reality that's just a small sort of frame or small picture. Um, and then it doesn't matter when we eat, just as you were saying there, no it doesn't. You can have three meals a day, four meals, five, six, eight, whatever it may be. I think most people are going to eat four times a day breakfast, lunch, dinner, and maybe a snack, or lunch, dinner, and maybe two snacks. Um, yeah, go ahead. Question. So I know that you said that you want to go into more about like gut health and stuff. Um, so obviously, spacing your meals is probably the best thing to do with your energy throughout the day. So I know people would do intermittent fasting and things, but what I, for me personally, I feel very sick in the morning. Um, and I can't really eat breakfast. It takes me at least a couple of hours before I can actually eat a breakfast. And then that affects um, being able to have sort of regular meals throughout, throughout that day. day. Yeah. Um, is there sort of a way to all balance that? What do you know of? Or this is one of the issues with, with something like intermittent fast, especially if you have a higher calorie intake. So say for example, if I had somebody who's eating 3,000 calories and they're eating, like I was on the phone to a girl the other day and she was following an OMAD diet, which is just basically an intermittent fast, which is one meal a day. To get all your caloric needs in one meal is really difficult. And what happens when you eat a huge amount of food? You feel bloated, you feel tired, like your digestion is poor. So realistically, you're looking at your eating windows throughout the rest of that day and you're trying to plan them. So like, I would never say to you eat breakfast because if it doesn't fit, the, the, the only issue or the only time I would recommend that to someone is if someone is not eating breakfast and then they're binging because their blood sugar levels are low. And then what tends to happen um, is this. You wake up in the morning and when your blood sugar level's low, and if you don't have really great control over those cravings or so forth, you're gonna do one or two things. You're gonna eat, or what most people do now is just take a coffee and have energy drinks. But then that's gonna wear off, and your blood sugar level's gonna get low if you haven't eaten anything. So then you're maybe gonna have another coffee. And then throughout the day, you're getting these highs, you're getting these lows. And the same thing can happen if you're eating the wrong foods, because if you're like, oh, I haven't made breakfast, like I'm just out and about. So the most important thing I try and tell people is, we need to teach you what to do when you're not on a plan, because you need to be able to think. So it'd be like, okay, Claire, when you're in work, what's the closest thing you have to you? I've got a canteen downstairs. Okay, what are the options? So you start thinking outside the box. Could we bring stuff in, put them in an office? Could we do this, could we do that? Because we'll always default to whatever's around us. 
Do you know what I mean? So for you, if you can control that and you feel good, just do that. But getting those meals in, the quickest thing is either liquid calories or adding um, maybe certain fats to your food so that you're not having a huge amount of volume or you feel like you're, you're sickening after that. Um, like we said, calories do matter. And for anybody who's looking body composition, uh, Dan Party and Stephen Gainette's book, uh, Why We Gain Fat. Fat loss requires that the calories leaving the body exceed the number for an extended period of time. So I always like to emphasize that it has to be for an extended period of time. And short of liposuction, there's no basically way around that math. Um, and for all practical purposes, a calorie is a calorie. You always hear this debate. Yeah, 100 calories of broccoli is not the same as 100 calories of ice cream. To the human body, it sort of is, right? Now, obviously, we know the broccoli has vitamins, minerals, more fiber is, you know, is going to thing. But to the body, if I had Skittles or brown rice, and I eat them, my body breaks them down into glucose. Now, the rate at which they break down are different. What We know that one's going to be better for us, but it doesn't mean that it's perfect. Because I'm sure people have heard of, you know, people having Haribo while they train or having Cocoa Pops post-workout. So you can have these things. The only issue we have is can you control yourself after eating those? Uh, and do they stimulate you to eating more? So just covering again just those, those basics. Regardless of what diet you do, intermittent fasting, uh, carb backload, like high carb, low carb, whatever it is, every one of those diets, 80% of the things that they recommend will be good, whole, nutritious food, right? That I always say, instead of focus on the differences, look at the commonalities across the board. We need to be aware of discretionary calories. Liquid calories are probably the biggest one when we have a frappe, uh, a frappe or a cappuccino or we maybe have um, oils or dressings on our food and then our calories then tend to just start cl like claiming, claiming, claiming. Um, so we need to be aware of those, okay? Make each, each meal high protein. So we looked at it, we know the protein needs made is going to be beneficial. Obviously loads of veggies. If you don't get enough veg, I always recommend a super green supplement or... Um, the tablets, if you're not, if you don't like that grassy type taste, which I know most people don't, but having fiber in your diet is so important. Like anything, too much fiber can have a negative effect, but I don't think enough people get that anyway. Avoid liquid calories. So we know beer, an average pint of beer is two to 300 calories, depending on that. An average bottle of wine, 750 calories, if not more. Do you know what I mean? So. Uh, pick your meal timing and frequency that you prefer. So as Claire mentioned there, if you don't want to have breakfast, that's okay. As long as you can control your appetite and you don't go, oh, Jesus, right, I'll just grab whatever's handy. Um, and if you want to eat three meals or four meals or six meals, you do that. And then sleep, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. And then obviously consistency, adherence, all those sort of things. So, go ahead. It will matter if you weigh yourself first thing in the morning the next day. Not that you've put on weight. It's the fact that that's probably still in your gut from the night before being digested. So a lot of people who eat late in their normal times may find that they'll wake up and they'll weigh themselves and they'll panic. Um, if like the research is conclusive, you don't get enough sleep as well. You're going to be more impulsive with your food decisions. You're going to be you're going to weigh heavier. So if you're eating later, yes. So I would say leave it until you know later on that day. But um, no, it doesn't really make a difference because the, the thing was, oh, if you're eating and you're not burning it off, then you're going to put on weight. Well, the thing is, if you've burned, like you probably have, 3,000 calories up to 8 o'clock and then you have a meal that basically matches your caloric intake for the day, your weight should not change. Do you know what I mean? Or if it's below. Um, so they're just the basic things, some of the practical things that we were doing there. If you don't want to strict count, if you don't want to weigh and measure food and you don't want to be on my fitness pile 24 seven, because I think it's a great tool. I think it teaches nutritional education in terms of understanding what you're putting in your body. Because the biggest thing that we, that I want people to do from that standpoint is understand what they're taking in. Okay. When you get people aware of what they're taking in, you tend to find that their eating behaviors and habits change. And there's amazing research to say, like people go, oh, you know, it's 70% nutrition or 80% nutrition, isn't it? We'll put it like this. When you exercise, 
it makes you more inclined to want to eat better. So they work hand in hand. Do you know what I mean? You don't, you don't just go, I'm going to start eating better, and you're like, oh, this is great. But if you don't have exercise as an appetite regulator or something that gets you going, I have something to work towards here, it, it can be difficult. Um, protein every meal, foods with high, uh, high water content, and obviously those calorie-dense foods, nuts and oils. Uh, avoid eating on the run if you can. Obviously, that's really difficult because we're all stressed out. We're all busy. We've all got shit to do. We're all super important. Um, if you can plan when you're going to eat, if I had a pound for a month, or even a, uh, a one P for the month of 10 people like, PJ, I've got a wedding at the weekend. What am I going to do? Or I've got this night out. I'm like, you work your ass off all week and you enjoy your, your day or you enjoy your meal. Do you know what I mean? It's just basically thinking about it. Make it sociable. We are sociable uh, creatures. The problem is if we are around a peer group, that likes junk food and drink. Like if you have a group of friends that are out partying every week, <laughs> right? Are you more inclined to go and party? Of course you are, right? If you have people who are going to eat more takeaways, more junk food, you're probably more inclined. Uh, enjoy it, and then obviously eat slower. So there, there are like the real basic, basic things that I think most people should really look at, right? Now, when we look at this from a caloric standpoint or a a counter calorie standpoint, which is just, it's probably the most accurate form. It doesn't have to be the only form. You can just look at food quality, you can reduce, you can add exercise, whatever it is. But to look at it in terms of, you know, why we push calories on people or tell people to track is because they're the most consistent form of data that we have, okay? Now, if I have someone here who, uh, to maintain their weight, they need to eat 2,500 calories. Every day, if they eat that, their weight will not change. Okay, it won't change. Maybe, maybe they eat more carbs on a Monday than they do on a Tuesday, but the calories are still the same. There may be a slight fluctuation, but their weight will always sort of balance out, okay? Now, when we look at it from a standpoint of we wanna lose weight, the most common thing that people will do is they'll put themselves into, on average, a 500 calorie deficit. Anybody understand why 500? Pound a week, yeah. So 3,500 calories is the equivalent of one pound. Okay, so they're basically saying if over the seven days, if you put yourself in a 500 calorie deficit, you should be losing one pound a week, right? Which is a hypothetical thing because the human body is great at adapting, right? Now, if anybody who's worked with me, I tend to like to go into, in terms of food deficits, about 200 calories, right? The reason why is if you're exercising, you're burning calories. If you put yourself in a lower calorie deficit in terms of food, you're less likely to want to binge. Like if I cut 500 calories out of all your diets, you would feel it. Like your, your stomach, you're like, feels like my throat's uh, ripped off. So obviously in order to do that, we do need to put ourselves in a, in a deficit and that needs to be done through exercise or food. And then the issue that we have is we bust our balls all week, right? In work, we've got great routine. We get up at a certain time, we eat at a certain time. You know, the kids go to bed at a certain time. We've got things going on. And then the weekend comes. And then we overindulge. And we overindulge because we're staying up later. Right? We feel entitled that we deserve a treat or I don't want to cook, so I'm going to have a takeaway. Nothing wrong with that. You can have a takeaway. Just plan ahead. Just say, listen, do you know what? I'm going to fast or I'm going to get out and I'm going to do a hike or I'm going to exercise or I'm going to do something that makes me enjoy this. I was talking to someone the other day, they went skiing for the first time and they came back and they're like, I've lost weight. And I was like, I'm not surprised because you're actually moving so much when you're skiing. Like, and then you don't actually have a lot of time to eat because you're not around food all the time. You're around beer, but it's different. Um, but that tends to be the pattern that most people follow. I call them as weekend warriors. And, you know, we just need to go, well, what's some of the healthier habits that we can implement that can sort of regulate this a little bit better? Could it be trying to go to bed at the same time, which probably isn't going to be most people's because they're probably catching up on sleep, um, or just trying to keep the same meal timings is probably the best one. Okay, uh, I remember last time I did a photo shoot, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, um, and this is on the previous gym that we had. I started work at 12 in the afternoon. 
So Lenny would do the morning shift, I would do the evening shift. And then on the Thursday, Friday, I would do the morning shift and he would do the evening. And what I found is on the day that I started at 12, I'd wake up naturally about half eight, nine. I would go and train. I'd come back, have my breakfast about half 10. And all my meals throughout the day were great. Didn't feel hungry. It was amazing. On the mornings that I had to get up early, I would go, oh, have to eat first thing in case I lose muscle and all this crap. So then I would eat my meals and by about, Six o'clock that evening, all my meals were gone and I'm starving. And I'm still going to bed at the same time, 10 o'clock. So I'm like, how does this work? Like, Because I just slept there, I feel this is okay. But when I have to get up early and I have to, because you, you feel like you're, you're hungrier throughout the day because you're awake longer, if that makes sense. So regulating my food. So what I did was, see on the days where I was in the morning, I fasted until the times where I would have ate on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So I, I basically, I believe it's like a food clock. You set yourself on a timer. And again, that's great. If you work in retail or you work in catering, you might not get that luxury of that time. I understand that. So we, we have to really plan those. But looking at it and going, that's not serving me. What can I change? What do I need to adapt? Do I need to get out and be active? Or the reason why I love, and, and Orla, when she comes in, will tell you, like, we have to have a gym everywhere we go. And the only reason why is, yes, I love exercise, but in my head, I'm going, at least if I work out, I'm eating that cake later. So I'm justifying it and trying to balance in my head. Um, but we just need to be careful of those patterns. And again, that's what most people are going to do. Uh, and the discretionary calories are a big thing. Um, and again, most people understand that, like we were saying there, there's been a reduce in sugar intake. There's still been an increase in obesity. So people always tell you, oh, it's not sugar's fault. It's overeating. That's a problem. We're, we're constantly overeating. So the old thing is, if you have a fat dog, what would you do? You'd say walk it more and feed it less. Which in the simplest element is true. And it's the same with human beings. But what I always tell people, you're dealing with a human being who has emotions, that has bias, that has like thought processes that is emotional. So if you just say, oh, I, no, you just gotta do more and eat less. Well, I've been trying that and it hasn't worked. So we obviously need to look at the things that are causing us to overeat. And starting in this top left-hand corner, if you have an unhealthy lifestyle, and an unhealthy lifestyle would be, you're not getting enough exercise or activity, right, to stimulate your body, and you're not getting enough sleep, right? And see if you don't get enough activity, it's gonna be really difficult for you to regulate your appetite, right? So you ever notice when you come to the gym, if you know you're gonna to go to the gym, you're probably gonna eat something better beforehand. If you exercise really hard, you're not hungry when you finish. So then you have like maybe another hour or so when you have your food and then you're like, oh, feel good, right? And when you do something positive, it almost precedes another positive action. If you exercise, you're more likely to wanna to eat something healthy and then obviously you feel better about yourself, you have more energy and so forth. And then, the, the opposite is true as well. If you do something, you go out on the drink, you wake up the next day, you're hanging, you just want greasy, junky food, you eat it, makes you feel better for a minute or two, and you're like, ah, oh, I'll, I'll do that again, and it creates a negative loop. And the only way to break the negative loop is to do something positive. So I tell my clients, if you go out on a Saturday night, binge, enjoy yourself, make sure you're in the gym on a Monday. I'm hanging. The session is probably gonna be the worst session you ever did. It's probably gonna be shit. But you break that loop, and when you leave, you're like, I'm glad I've done that, okay? So when you have this unhealthy lifestyle and you have no way of regulating your appetite and you have no way of creating a margin to overeat. So if you went and burned 500 calories by doing an hour of cardio, you've give your body 500 calories extra that it can eat that day. But if you don't do that, if you don't exercise, you don't give yourself that extra. I mean, it's like doing overtime, doing the overtime so you can get more money. You know, do the exercise, put it in so you can eat more. And then when you have insufficient sleep, that has shown massively that there's a, a huge increase of impulsivity of you wanting to grab quick junk food. And again, uh, I was listening to, anybody know who Matthew Walker is? So Matthew Walker has wrote a book of why we sleep. Um, and he's just had a podcast there. I think he came out today with uh, Stephen Bartlett, Diary of CEO. And I'd highly recommend you listen to it. But he was basically saying that, you know, when you're sleep deprived, which most of us are during the week anyway, um, and then we make that, that sleep dead up on the weekend, you choose easier tasks, right? You don't want hard tasks. You're in work, you're, you're choosing the lowest task jobs, 
right? The things that don't take a lot of thought process, right? And we're going to be more impulsive. We're going to grab more things to give us pick-me-ups and give us a kick. And then our drive to eat pleasurable food is obviously higher. Now, you put that person with this unhealthy lifestyle and you put them into modern-day society where you've got processed foods everywhere, you have food queues, you know, you've got smells of food, you go into supermarkets, you've got the bread section, you go around to common market, you've just got food stalls everywhere, um, you're getting bombarded with marketing, and then you have all this great taste in food, and there's a little thing that you can do, um, and it happened to me at a nutrition seminar where a guy says, who hasn't eaten breakfast? And I put my hand up, and he brought over a biscuit to me, and he's like, smell the biscuit. I was like, great, he's like, what you cannot control is your mouth is salivating right now. Now, I'm not going to say I was like a dog. <laughs> but like, you can feel. And then we did another task where he just, he got everybody to close their eyes and he just got everybody to visualize your favorite food. Right? If you were to visualize that right now and think about, oh, say it was a bosom, high taste and so forth, your mouth will start to salivate. So imagine what that's like when it's right in front of you and you can smell it. Okay? So those things are powerful. Um, and when we talk about social support, if somebody's out buying the junk and it's in the house, you're more likely to eat it. Okay, the worst ones, <laughs> the worst ones are mums. I don't eat any of that there, I buy for the kids, right? If it's in the house, you're more likely to eat it, right? Especially when you're stressed, because stress eating is so, uh, is one of the biggest things that, that I think most people struggle with. Okay, we're chronically stressed from physical stress, mental stress, everything. So you have that modern day food. You have no way of regulating your appetite and you have your body crying out for highly sugar, highly palatable foods. You're getting less quality in the food. So you're not, it's not filling you. You're not getting the volume, right? And you're doing more non-hunger based eating, right? So basically what non-hunger based eating, eating is, it stands for hedonic eating, is eating eating for the sake of boredom or eating for pleasure, right? And the example I always get, if I go for a three course meal, at the end of the three course meal, I go, I'll have a cheese board. I'm not ordering a cheese board because I'm hungry. I'm ordering a cheese board because it's fucking nice. Do you know what I mean? And we all do it. So we, we need to think about those things. We're eating for boredom and pleasure, not for survival, okay? And then that's what's gonna to lead to overeating. And then obviously when we overeat, we get heavier. And the things that can influence in that, yes, your age, stress levels, your weight and your eating history. If you have disordered eating, an eating disorder, if you were heavier, if you were lighter, your genetic profile, okay? Um, inflammation, so inflammation can be caused by anything, physical stress, mental stress, um, nutritional habits, disease. Um, your social factors, the people you're around, your environment is the biggest thing that we can control. Uh, your weight control interest, which basically means are you interested in losing weight or not? Like if you're sitting in the house and you've got a beer belly and you're happy and your wife or your partner loves you and you've kids and everything's great, why would you want to go to the gym? Do you know what I mean? Most of the times those people have to get a health scare for them to even consider that. Your socioeconomic status is a massive thing. So again, we need to understand if I have a client and they go and they want to have a Mars bar, and it's 80p for a Mars bar, but you can buy four for a pound in Poundland. I even tell them, it makes more fucking sense to buy the four. Yeah. But we also know if you buy the four, you're gonna eat the four. And it may not be at that one time. Okay, and then obviously a sign of wealth 100, 200 years ago was you were heavy because you could afford food. Nowadays, again, it comes down to the processed foods, the high amount of saturated fats, the discretionary calories that we have in liquids and so forth. And then obviously poor food choices because we have a lack of education around it. Uh, infections, dietary beliefs. Uh, the dietary beliefs ones, I always tend to, to look at the, the vegans and the vegetarians. Uh, vegans more so. Because they're doing it as a dietary belief, they assume that they're not going to eat animal-based products, but then a lot of them eat a lot of junk. The difference is, Orly, your food quality is really good. She grows a lot of her food, makes her own food, where a lot of people are just like, I'm gonna eat Cheetos. Yes, way to go, great great vegan diet there. Do you know what I mean? So, um, and again, it can be a great healthy diet if it's plant-based, but we just tend to go, oh, well, I'm choosing to do this for ethical reasons, whatever it is. Our gastrointestinal health, if you suffer from IBDs or different illnesses, that can affect your ability to lose weight. 
And then obviously giving up smoking, time availability, your education, and then a big one, emotional eating. So you have that unhealthy person in today's society. It's really difficult, and it's, it's a reason why we struggle to, to lose weight or, or get into a certain body composition. Yeah? Yeah, because I, I really want to address this because it's it's something that cropped up on my advanced nutrition seminar, ECA. It's something that the girls have mentioned a lot. Um, I've done a full seminar on menopause. Um, I plan on doing an even more in-depth full one on the menstrual cycle um, because I think it's important. I think there's a lot of misinformation about it. Yeah. 100%. So PCOS, endometriosis. Uh, I mean, I'd like to do one on fertility. Yeah, that would be uh, probably help. Um, so the males may not want to listen to this, but uh, pretty much this is the, a female menstrual cycle. It can last anywhere between 25 to possibly up to 35 days for females. Uh, and basically it's broken down into these phases, follicular phase, ovulation, luteal phase. And these are the different hormones uh, that are circulating in and around those times. Um, and at different stages of this cycle, their weight could be higher, it could be lower, they could have higher food cravings, they could have better glucose tolerance, they could have better strength. There's research coming out to say that now when it's coming towards the end of the month, that they're, they're, they're at a higher increased risk of injuries, right? Because of bone density and so forth, right? Uh, and the main homo hormones we have, estrogen and progesterone, estrogen being that hormone that helps us be able to take in more carbohydrates and be able to tolerate more carbs, right? That's in the blue, right? What happens when it's getting to that point when our period's coming? Is it as high as it was? No. So the point I'm, I'm making here, I'm going to go on to this next slide, right, is that our glucose tolerance isn't as good coming to the end of our cycle. And what's the thing that we really struggle with at that time? Cravings. So the research is not backing that you should be eating more carbs at this time. And this is the point I wanted to make. But I'm also a human being and I understand I've got a human being in front of me. So I can't just say, oh, well, the research says you shouldn't have any carbs, right? And this final phase coming on to it. Yeah. So ovulation is basically when you're ovulating, eggs drop, and this is where you're starting to have your, your periods. Okay. But as you can see here, the luteal phase is where progesterone is at its high. So this part, meaning our insulin sensitivity is diminished, which means we can eat carbs. We just, we're not utilizing them as best we can. And the, the reason why I wanted to put that in there, because again, you'll hear people going, you know, if you want to have more chocolate that week, you can. And here, we also know, do you remember the first thing I said? We're governed by thermodynamics. So even if you had more carbs that week, as long as you're within your calories, you're, you're grand. And this is just research. And I understand, like I said, I've got a human being in front of me. I've got a female in front of me who may be spotting. They may have ha heavy bleeds. They may have more stomach cramps, bloating, pains. I need to be, you know, I, like I have to accept that. Because that's higher. Yeah. And again, this would be for somebody who's having normal cycles. There's, there's people that haven't had a cycle in years because of coil or because of certain contraceptives. Okay. But this is just basically what, what would be happening from this sort of standpoint. Um, and for me, where I stand on this is because people go oh, cravings at certain times. If I have a female who wants to lose weight and she's on 1200 calories and she's bust on her ass to lose weight, is she going to have, regardless of her menstrual cycle, is she going to have more food cravings? Yeah. So my goal is, especially with females I work with, I want to try and get their calories as high as possible. I want to try and keep their carbs as high as possible so that we have something to work with rather than starting low. So I think putting people in a better starting position 
is going to be better. Because if we take, and again, uh, <laughs> this can't happen, but if we take these, the hormones away from it, right? What manipulates these hormones as well is what we put on our body. If we were to take that away, if I had someone on a really low calorie diet who's working hard, they're going to have food cravings, okay? Um, so it, it's important that we give people the right things. And there's a, there was a study done there on a group that followed a weight loss, like a calorie controlled diet, and these were females. And the other group that, that followed a diet called a men, <laughs> menstrual diet, I think it was called. And basically what they did is they optimized the diet around the menstrual cycle, right? And basically what happened was they give them more carbs at the start. And as it comes towards this, they give them less carbs and their proteins and fats went up. Okay. Now, when they looked at the weight loss difference in results, they found that the ones who had just a calorie controlled diet had just as good results. Okay. So the point being is you can optimize it to your cycle if you want. I've worked with people and sometimes it, it tends to get a wee bit cloudy. If I said to one of my female clients this week, you're going to have 200 grams of carbs. Next week, you're going to have 50 grams of carbs. Or if I change something else, it can sometimes get a wee bit complicated, especially for newbies. Right? But for most people, I always think if we can keep their calories high, keep their carbs high, put them in a slight deficit, they should get results. Give them enough energy to train and exercise and move. But it, it starts to become a wee bit difficult if we don't eat enough or we don't get enough. Um, as we can see here, during the first 14 days, estrogen is elevated, meaning the body can, uh, can be more insulin sensitive uh, and should handle carbs a little bit better. Okay? So in and around that ovulation phase, as we get down, it tends to diminish a little bit. Okay? Uh, when we look at strength, and obviously this was done on high female athletes, but uh, what they wanted to assess was the effects on strength and power around the menstrual cycle. And what they found is that there was no difference in performance uh, was observed based on hormonal contraceptive status. This suggests that the menstrual cycle does not alter acute strength and power performance on a group level and higher uh, level team athletes. So all that's really saying is, and again, what I'm taking from this, these are athletes, they're focusing on performance. It's not saying it's full of crap. What it's saying is the research is not conclusive. But what I also will say is everybody is different. Do you know what I mean? Everybody's cycle is different. Everybody else is different. I tend to think if we are focusing on strength training, we're focused on getting people to move and we're focused on keeping their calories high, they're less likely to have cravings. They're going to have better cycles because if you have someone in a deficit, like I've worked with a few people who have developed amnorrhea where they stop having periods, that's causing a health issue more down the line. So. It's talking about female athletes as well. So when we're talking about, they're going to be eating for performance as opposed to weight loss. So again, I'm, I'm not implying that this is everybody because like I said, there's some research to say that you're probably more susceptible to injuries coming up that time of the month. Okay. Because you're not, you develop osteoporosis, but you have more brittle bones. Okay. Because of the hormonal fluctuations. Um, and then obviously menopause and um, I've written a whole seminar from going from uh, pre-menopause, perimenopause, post-menopause, like everything that can get us in there. And there's up to 40 different symptoms that can occur with this. And again, a bit like the menstrual cycle, they can all differ per person, right? This isn't like, there is some things that are unique, like the half flushes and so forth. But some people get them more severe than others. Some people get, uh, you know, more sleep problems, whatever it is. Okay, um, and how we manage this, there's obviously different things. There's medical intervention, TSRT. There is lifestyle interventions. We can do exercise, uh, you know, magnesium is a massive part of that. Uh, making sure that we try and get more improved sleep because realistically what's happening in the menstrual cycle and this is, and this is one of the biggest issues, is your body heat. Female body heat will elevate Okay, and then that's going to cause more issues here on this side. Um, like I said, I don't want to spend a huge amount then. And then obviously they'll, most people will say, oh, well, I'm struggling to lose weight or I'm gaining weight because of my menstrual cycle. I go the whole way back to that thermodynamics. It is a calories in, calories out model. 
when you're going through menopause, what tends to happen is your metabolic rate will lower, right? You're more likely to suffer muscle loss, osteoporosis. So if you're, if you're basically going, I'm eating maintenance calories, and then you go into a perimenopausal stage, right, where you're going through the transition, what you could suddenly happen is this maintenance could drop and you don't know. And you continue to eat the same way that you normally did and what's gonna happen? You'll put on weight, okay? Um, so we just need to be aware of some of those factors. And again, with this, and even the menstrual cycle, sorry to just go on about this, I always go back to it differs per person and I need to understand. If somebody's coming into me and they're going through that uh, and they're maybe getting a half flush, they maybe don't want to exercise, maybe feel embarrassed, you know, so there's, there's those things that stop you from exercising that probably, you know, even though we know they could help, but it's that perception of where they are and if people are looking at them and all this sort of stuff. So again, we don't want to say that stuff we're talking about, just think it's all crap because it's not, it differs per person, but these are just some of the main things that are covered there. Um, and then obviously for men, as we get older, we tend to develop prostate problems, bladder cancer, incontinence, testicular problems, erectile dysfunction, heart disease, high blood pressure, physical and emotional health problems. And so obviously it's important that we look after them because if we don't, if we don't precede these things, it's gonna be difficult for us to actually try and avoid these for as long as possible, okay? Um, so obviously we wanna try and look after our food intake. We wanna try and get as much satiety. So that means eating protein. That means increasing our fiber, caloric density. We look at 400 calories, how that's broken down into oils, how that's broken down into say saturated fat and proteins, and how that's broken down into vegetables. And as you can clearly see, the vegetables is obviously gonna fill the stomach. There is different receptors in the stomach, right? That basically regulate how much food is in there, right? There's certain hormones that are produced and that tells your body whether you need to stop eating or you need to eat more. And you look at, like Laurie, as you mentioned earlier, about food volume. If I'm having 400 calories and they're coming from oils, right? Maybe I'm having, uh, you know, coconut oil with something and I'm having olive oils on dressing and so forth. It's not very satiating to me. Okay, so we obviously want to look at food volume and there's a diet called the volumetrics diet. I don't recommend just to follow it, but the concept is good. If you fill up on these lower calorie, more nutrient dense foods, you're going to have more room for more calories. You're going to have, again, more satiety because you're not going to feel as hungry. Okay. And then obviously this is basically what happens hormonally. If we have an empty stomach, our body produces this hormone called ghrelin. Ghrelin is our hunger hormone that tells us, hey, listen, eat something. Um, when we have a full stomach, our body stops producing that ghrelin and it produces a different hormone called leptin. Uh, so we need to understand those things. Oh, I had that on there again. And some of the things I want you to think about, when you're looking at body composition, when you're looking at performance, there should be different stages in your training. A lot of people think that they just should lose weight, lose weight, lose weight. I know people who've been dieting for years, right? There's, there's times where you need to have a break. There's times where you need to focus on exercise and just movement. Times where you need to focus on how can I improve my strength? How can I improve my running time? How can I improve, uh, you know, my energy, whatever it may be. And I try and do this with most people. I try and go, right, and I think the sweet spot's about six weeks, right? You, you'll see that six week challenges and stuff are very popular. And the reason why I think, in my opinion, why they're popular is it's enough time to see results, but short enough that people could probably stick to it, right? Because life will hit you up the face at some point. Work will get busy, kids are not well, like maybe somebody passes away, whatever it is, and then your focus just shifts to something else, okay? And what the research says is, over the course of 12 months when they track people on diets, their dietary adherence, the levels of actual application diminish over time because people get fed up. So they're, they're less stringent with what they do. Um, so if I'm trying to lose fat, I might want to do a cut. I want to try and maintain, keep those results, maybe want to increase my calories and so forth. If I'm trying to build muscle, 
a micro sort of a, a maintain or sorry a gain phase and a maintain and then cutting and so forth. Now, I didn't talk about carbs there, okay, because I wanted to leave it till here. Has anybody heard of insulin? Yeah. So it, it, it was really popularized and it was it was labeled the bad hormone, right? And it's a storage hormone, it does its job, it, there's nothing good or bad about it, right? But basically what happens is when we eat some carbs, right, our body produces insulin because its job is to go, right, I'm going to take that carbs and I put it into energy into cells. This may be a wee bit complex because I teach some of this stuff to, uh, on the advanced nutrition course, but I wanted to just bring it up. Um, but we produce insulin, the food gets in, our blood glucose, our blood sugar levels go up. Um, and when insulin is increased, its job is to push those carbohydrates into our cells or push them into fat cells, right? So obviously, if we're eating food, if there's food in my bloodstream, right, available to use as energy, will my body use stored energy or body fat? Will it use that? Why? So, uh, so let me rephrase. If I have energy in my body, right, so I've just eaten something, right, it's in my bloodstream, would my body favor that or would it fa favor the body fat to use as a source of fuel? Yeah, it, it will use what's in, what is in here first, right? It's not going to use what's stored, right, because there's energy available. Now, if I would not need anything for a while and I have storage and I have body fat, my body will go, okay, hold on. I'll use that stored energy, right? And we can get into those stored energy at multiple times throughout the day, or obviously if you fast and so forth. But the old logic was you add carbs, your blood sugar uh, and blood glucose levels went up, your body produced insulin, which stores, right? Stores energy in cells and fat cells. And then obviously what will tend to happen is we become fatter, which is wrong, okay? Your body will only become heavier or store more body fat if you're in a calorie surplus, okay? Now, this is what a healthy cell should look like, okay? These are the cells in your body and muscle cells. And what should happen is you have these little receptors, right? And on these receptors, as you can see, the blue is insulin and insulin's job is to connect. So think of it as like a key in a door, right? So insulin goes up to this door and it's like, John, I'm gonna open this door and you can go in, right? Now, that's its job. John goes in there, he's a, a carbohydrate, he's a piece of energy. Once he gets in there, this is my stored energy which I'm gonna use for exercise and, and so forth, yeah? Now what happens is, if we become overweight, we become sick, we become what's known as insulin resistant. Which basically, if we look at the cells now, they went from being blue to gold, which means, the lock on the door is broke. I can't, I can't get John in here, right? There's no room for him to go, which is gonna cause an issue. Because the issue is, if I can't put that in there, this is circulating in my bloodstream, right? And if we think back to what we were talking about, that hormone insulin, insulin's job is to map this all up. It's to go, I need to put you somewhere. Like you can't, you can't stay here. You need to go somewhere. And where's it gonna go? Yeah, it's, it's gonna be stored as fat. Okay, now. When does that happen? It's not that they can't find a place. The cell is just not receptive. And that'll come down to overweight. Metabolic conditions like obesity, diabetes, um, maybe you have various different illnesses, maybe you've been eating too much carbohydrates, not enough protein. So those things tend to happen. Um, so this is where insulin resistant, and that's what I was talking about with the menstrual cycle. You're more like this at the end of the cycle than you are at the start. But you can change insulin resistant cells by eating more protein exercise yep because if you burn if you burn this exercise out here what does it crave it craves more energy right so this is where we, that's why it's called sensitivity so the best way to improve your sensitivity is exercise and eating well 
Yeah. And I only wanted to show this because this is quite complex because it's more physiology, but it sort of shows what you're up against if we are chronically overeating, right? We're eating the wrong foods, yeah? We're gonna have this in the bloodstream and insulin is just doing its job. Its job is just to clear the way, okay? Um, so has anybody heard of metabolic flexibility? No, uh, it's just because I had it there, but metabolic flexibility is when your body can utilize carbs and fats as sources of fuel, right? The problem we have in society today is we eat mostly carbs, so our body favors carbs. That's the, the main reason. Um, but when you have metabolic inflexibility, it's a consequence of impaired cellular glucose uptake, or glucose uptake which basically means your body can't absorb those carbs. Okay, it's then stored as body fat. Now, if you have insulin resistance, but you're in a deficit for that day, you should be okay because your body still needs more, okay? Um, and then, again, I always ask this question, when do we lose weight? Yeah, that's when we lose the biggest amount of weight. Yes, we can have small dips throughout the day, but when we lose our weight is here, so we're focusing on a lot of the times the wrong things by going, I'm going to starve myself today. I'm going to work extra, extra hard to try and lose two pounds to cheat a scale. When the paid paper is going to come calling at the end of the night when you sleep and it calculates. Um, so sleep becomes super important. Uh, so recovery. How to, max, how to maximize your results at the gym. This is something I covered the other week on the Facebook page. Nutrition, recovery, training is all interlinked. Okay, you have the right nutrition, that's going to improve your recovery, that's obviously going to improve your training. If you're working your ass off, you don't have the right nutrition, you're not going to recover, and vice versa. And basically, this is based on this theory here, right? Big fancy name, super compensation theory. But it basically means when you train, right? When you go into the gym and you train, you're technically weaker when you leave, right? You're more weaker <laughs> than when you first arrived. But then what will happen? Over a period of time, it could be 24 hours, it could be 48 hours, it could be, uh, you know, 72 hours. You will recover from that session and then you will technically be stronger than you were the session before. Yeah? That's basically what happens. But if we train too hard, our recovery becomes impaired and it's going to take us way longer to get back to this. Okay. If we train too little, we won't get a, enough response. And then there's a, obviously a genetic component to this because if we were able just to train it all the time and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, then we'd all be machines. Okay. So there is a limit to this, but we need to understand that that's a part of it. A part of it as well is obviously our muscles. Okay. Again, I know we're talking about nutrition, but if you don't look after your body in terms of movement, uh, in terms of stretching, in terms of mobility, in terms of uh, body maintenance, muscles will become tighter, shorter, causes, need to on, do um, Can cause issues in terms of muscle knots, injuries, and so forth. And if you're injured, it's gonna be hard to get in shape. Hydration is a massive thing. I'm a huge proponent of uh, pink salt in water. I think it's just a natural electrolyte rather than you have to worry about taking legacy at sports or maybe taking these electrolytes. Take a pinch of Himalayan rock salt in some water before you come in and exercise. You'll notice a difference. Take a post-workout again, because all it is is sodium. It's an electrolyte. Um, and sleep. What they found was nurses who slept six or fewer hours per night gained significantly more weight, okay, on an average of two and a half pounds from those who had six hours, 1.6 pounds, and for those who had seven plus hours, were grand. Matthew Walker, the guy of why we sleep uh, has extensively went into this research of why sleep is important. And it used to be, you know, I remember the old Arnie quote, which was uh, sleep faster, you know? And basically what he was saying is, in a capitalist society, we're told to stay awake more, make more money, consume more stuff, produce more stuff. When in reality, he sort of said, this is the natural what would I say, age reversing elixir that we have, right? And if we're not getting enough of it, you're gonna see that more impulsive eating habits, poor dietary habits, and more likely to be overweight. 
And as we said here, the less sleep you get, the more you're likely to lose muscle mass as well. Okay, so 55% lost less body fat when they got five or, or more, and they lost 60% more muscle than those who had more sleep. I get it. Not everybody can get that amount of sleep, right? I, I'm a realist as well. I probably get five, six hours, and I try and nap to try and make it up. Um, but the difference you would see in having a good night's sleep on your body composition and your weight the next day is, is night and day. Okay, so sleep is important. Uh, and then we look at pro athletes. This is just a, a combination. Uh, that's probably why Tiger Woods looks terrible these days. Um, I thought that tampon thing was blown out of proportion, but that's just me. Uh, but yeah, making sure that you're looking after your body physically, you're eating the right things, you're hydrating it, you're getting enough sleep. They're the main things that are going to happen with your recovery. Because people go, can you overtrain? And some people will say you can. And some people will say, well, overtraining is just under recovery. It's a combination of both because if you've never trained before and you go in and you start training five days a week, that first week's probably <laughs> overtrained, probably overkill. Okay. And then obviously other ways that we can look at managing our stress, we have cold water therapy, which is obviously a big massive thing at the minute. And then we have heat therapy. You can do now the big proponent is a combination of both, hot and cold, because all we're really doing is how do we manage inflammation, stress? How do we manage that? We can manage that through exercise. Right, which induces inflammation as well, but we can manage it with exercise and movement. We can get cold, we can get warm, we can eat certain foods that can all make a, a big impact. Okay, um, and all that stuff only matters if you buy into the process. Okay, it means jack shit. If you have a great coach, it means nothing if he can't get you to do or you do not want to do what it is. Uh, and he's, here's some of the things that you may not know that are going to obviously improve your performance. Gut microbiome, anybody ever heard of that before? It's basically your gut health. It's basically the bacteria that's in your gut. And what this is going to show is that if you have poor gut health, you're more likely to suffer from depression, mental illness, more likely to be overweight. So it has a massive impact, and it's something that we don't really talk about. Um, it affects our immune system. It affects our intestinal permeability, like the health of our uh, intestines, our mood, and our mental state. Okay, because our gut is our second brain, what we put in our body, and I always joke, see, unless you're sticking things up your arse, everything is coming through, down your gullet. Obviously, we can absorb things through our skin transdermally and so forth, but we are the master of our own downfall. Okay, um, and it, basically, alterations of gut microbiome have been linked to various cancers, cardiovascular disease, acne, obesity, uh, psychological disorders such as autism and ADHD. If you have kids who suffer from this, there's a great book called Gaps, Gut and Psychology Syndrome. A great way to try and manage these, basically through the foods that we eat. Okay, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be pharmaceutical interventions. You know, they might need them, but I always try and look for, is there something I can do? Health ways, fitness ways, nutrition ways that can help. Uh, and what we tend to see is, if we get a change in our gut bacteria because we're eating the wrong foods, we're eating processed foods, uh, we can get candida infections, we can get overgrowth and then that can lead to being overweight and obese, okay? Obviously, what we're just taught is if you're in a calorie deficit, you should lose weight, but this sort of stuff can make it difficult to lose that weight, okay? Um, what causes those things to change? Antibiotics. I, I, don't, I can't remember the last time I took an antibiotic. Just, I try and avoid them as much as possible. Uh, caesareans, uh, certain aspects of modern hygiene highly processed diets and indoor living. So basically these are the things, if you have someone who is sick, takes an antibiotic, I don't know if anyone's ever heard, you should be recommended a probiotic. Not bad doctor, but yeah, probiotic after is just basically healthy gut bacteria, repopulate that, just get them. Because what the antibiotic will do will wipe out everything. And if it wipes out all the good and the bad, if you start eating all the junk and the shit again, it's just gonna build up, okay? And then you've got things like gluten, um, the scurry monster, the gluten is, uh, that everybody talked about for ages, wanting to follow gluten-free diets. But basically, the only people who should not be eating gluten are those who are celiac, okay? Uh, I'll just talk a bit briefly about the, what that means in a second, but um, those diagnosed with celiac should be 100% gluten-free. Uh, increased prevalence of, of celiac is higher with people who have autoimmune conditions. 
right? An autoimmune condition could be thyroid condition. It could be uh, diabetes. Okay, it could be various different metabolic syndromes. When I work with someone that has an autoimmune condition, fibromyalgia, whatever it may be, this is the first thing I look at is their gut health, what they're putting in their body. Yes, you will have medical intervention and so forth, but I'm looking at, okay, how can we improve that? Because that affects your immune system. That's going to affect your ability to lose weight. That's going to affect your energy. That's going to affect your sleep. All these things are, are linked. Um, we've talked about it extensively. I think Jim, just because he's seen you there, we are talking about different things. And an autoimmune condition could be celiac, where you can't have gluten. It could be Durant's disease. It could be gluten ataxia. Then you have non-allergic, so you could have gluten sensitivity, which I think a lot of people have. You know these people who are like, oh, I can't eat gluten, I just feel bloated after. If you were celiac, you can't eat it. You know, it's gonna cause you serious problems. But you may go, if I eat too much bread, it gets me a wee bit sore. If I eat too much cheese, okay? And then we can have an allergic reaction, okay? So you have people who have Baker's asthma, maybe a food allergy, maybe a nut allergy. Maybe they need an EpiPen, depending on the severity of it. So these are the different things you may come up against. And I'm a big believer, you know, I used to recommend people go and get uh, blood tests and food allergy tests. They're not great. But what I will say is if you feel better not eating gluten, you feel less bloated, you have more energy, right? Stick with it, okay? Because the only true way that you're going to know if you're celiac is not a blood test, because if you take it out of your diet and you get a blood test, it won't show up. You actually have to get that endoscopy. <clears throat> uh, and if you want to, and this is something I always look at because I know I'm not really talking too much about fat loss and I'll answer some of these questions here in a sec because this is finished. Um, I'm looking at how can we improve your health, which is going to improve your energy your performance and so forth. And there's a protocol called the four R's, which is remove, replace, repair, and re-inoculate. So remove the food that is causing the issue. Okay, so you wanna look at the five main common ones are gluten, wheat, nuts, dairy, and eggs, right? So pick one of them, usually gluten or dairy is the best way to start. Um, remove them. Now, you're not gonna ask for a stool sample. You're not gonna Jillian McKeith it, right? Once you take that out, you wanna replace any of those deficiencies. So basically like digestive enzymes or uh, stuff that's gonna help you digest your food. So if anybody's seen any of my meal plans, there's three supplements I always recommend. Does anybody know what they are? I call them my health stack. Omega-3s, vitamin D, digestive enzymes. Because if we have vitamin D, so many things in terms of bone density, uh, androgen production, uh, all around health. Omega-3s, fish oils, because we don't get enough and it helps reduce inflammation. And then digestive enzymes, because if we're digesting our food better, we're more likely to absorb the nutrients. More likely, I'm not saying that we're all gonna be perfect, right? But basically, replace those things that we've lost. Then we're gonna look at repairing the body. Um, so obviously, our stomach can repair itself every four hours, but if we're eating the same shit that's causing the issue, we're not gonna see that, so we need to remove those things. And then obviously re-inoculate. So if anybody's ever been told to have probiotics to improve their gut health, the reason why probiotics are the very last thing you should do is if you take probiotics at the start, it can improve your health condition. And then you go, oh, I feel great, but you haven't solved the problem. The problem's still gonna be there when you stop. Okay, so obviously re-inoculate after that. What does that look like? When we look at, take out the junk food, replace it with hydrochloric acid, with the stomach acid, or replace it with um, digestive enzymes. We can replace it with these. This is one I use at a Helen and Bart, really simple. Um, Udo's Choice is another one. Um, and again, it just has proteas or pepsin in there. It helps you break down protein. It has lipase in there to help you break down fats and so forth. And I recommended this to a female client before because she was suffering from excessive bloating. And she felt amazing on these because it obviously helps digest your food better and get it through the system. So much so that she decided when she was going on holiday to Ibiza, she was going to take these pills. And I said, <laughs> people are taking other pills and you're running about taking these. Um, Obviously try and repair those gut tamins. We've got omega-3s, 
turmeric, curcumin obviously has always been a big one uh, recently. And I think curcumin is amazing. It's very expensive for an anti-inflammatory compared to fish oils. Um, glutamine is another one. And then obviously our probiotics. Uh, and I just put this in here because some people want to get into phenomenal shape. Right? And the way that you get someone into shape for a photo shoot or whatever it may be, you do the exact same things that I would recommend to my clients. You just do them stricter and for longer, honestly, because it, it's no different than what way I would set up your calories and macronutrients. And basically this has done a research on a guy who was doing a bodybuilding show. You put them into a deficit, you make them do exercise, you make them do cardio, you make them more protein and so forth, you get them to that end result. Um, and this is something I want to cover. So, if anybody's ever heard of a reverse diet? Yeah, so basically it's that approach there where you've lost weight and you're trying to maintain that weight, right? You're trying to keep that weight in for, for good. Um, and basically a very simple thing to do is increase calories each week. So basically what that looks like is, imagine my, you started on 2,500 and you've lost, you know, say for example, two stone and you wanna, you wanna keep that two stone. But by the time you get to there, you're eating say 1,400. What you might do is you might increase it by one or 200, so you might say 1,600. Then you might go 1,800 and you make slowly increase it. And then what you're doing on a week by week basis is assessing did your weight go up or not? Like there's nothing worse than you going through a diet, losing weight, getting great results. And then me telling you you have to eat more and then you panicking if you put on a pound. Yeah. And, and it happens. Now, the goal is, and what you should see if you do it properly is you shouldn't see any weight gain because you're, you're still under your maintenance, right? The hardest aspect is to get someone to buy into it because obviously physiologically, they've probably been eating less and it's gonna be harder for them to eat more. We've had this conversation as well. Um, but the great thing is, see when you see that you eat more food and you don't put on weight, sometimes you lose weight, you're like, what is this black magic, right? We, basically what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to get you to a point where you're back to a healthy range where you can maintain this weight loss. Because if you have 3000 calories to eat, for example, you have a lot of calories to eat before you put on weight. If you only have 1,400, that's one bad cheap meal and that's gone. Do you know what I mean? And if you have another couple of meals throughout the day, it can be so easy then to overeat. And if I have someone who comes to me who's on here, on these amount of calories, and I had this one girl, she was eating 1,000 calories. She came, she's, doing a, she's on a 12-week course with a bodybuilder. And I said, let me guess, you're grilling all your food, no salt, no sauces, training, doing cardio, yep. Okay, how's that affecting you? Like, how's that affecting your gut? Uh, have you any issues? Like, how's your period? She's like, haven't had a period. Um, yeah, energy is in the hole, so forth. Had a conversation, and then in the nicest possible way, I just went, you're screwed. She was like, I still want to lose weight. And I was like, you're eating a thousand calories. There's literally no lower that I can take you. You're starving yourself. So I said to her, here's what I want to do. I want to increase your calories till we get to a point without putting on weight, right? We're not going to put on weight. Your strength's going to improve. Your sleep's going to improve. Your energy's going to improve. And then when we get to a healthy point, I think it was 1800. Do you know what we did? Let's do our fat loss phase now. So you just basically put her in a better position. And this is all the reverse diet is. We're basically trying to get you out of jail. If anybody's heard my analogy, weight loss to me is like a bank robbery. You want to get in and get out before you get caught. Because if you're like, oh, I want to lose uh, two stone, and you get the two stone, and you're like, oh, I want to lose a wee bit more. You'll go, and you'll go, and you'll go, and then the holiday or something will happen, and then your focus will drop, and then you'll end up putting that weight back on. Okay, so you're better picking your battles, going in and going, I want to steal half a stone. Get half a stone off, bang, out, no issues, right? And then set yourself up. When, when can I go again? Maybe you give yourself a week off, okay, and maintain that. So this is an example 
of a reverse diet. So you have the guy up here who was in great shape and then obviously is slowly increasing his calories and is able to maintain a good amount of shape. The same with this female client here who is actually eating more but looks slimmer. You can't really see the amount of calories are on there, it's not really clear. But she is actually eating more food and looks in better shape. Okay, because sometimes if you don't give your body enough energy, enough nutrients, it won't give you enough, you know, energy to train with, enough to build muscle, enough to change how your body looks. And then that's going to affect your, your body composition, which is going to affect your body confidence. Okay, so the theory is, is you'll, you'll minimize fat gain while increasing your energy intake, set you up for your next diet or set you up for your next thing. Um, you'll have more muscle mass, less body fat. You can be able to eat more. It's a win-win, okay? Is it a longer process? Yes. I don't know if sometimes people think I'm bullshitting them. I just say, listen, here's what I would recommend. I'd recommend you do this. They're probably, you know, when we used to do the 12-week transformations, we used to say to people before they finished, here's what you need to do to maintain these results. Right? If you've been working your ass off doing five, six days a week in the gym, eating a certain way, doing cardio, see next week when you finish, you know, eat some more extra calories, a couple hundred more, but you gotta be in training still. And I think some people are thinking, he just wants me to stay on. No, I'm looking at it from a perspective of that I want you to maintain these. How many people out of say, out of 10 people, how many people do you think take me up on this reverse diet? Close. One, maybe one out of ten. Because they're like, fuck this, my top's coming off. Way. You know what I mean? So they want to enjoy all their hard work, and I get that. So that's why we use, we don't do 12 weeks as much. We tend to focus on shorter periods to do those little mini cuts, mini gains. Um, and this is for you people out there who maybe just want to improve your performance. You have different energy systems that work alongside with endurance athletes. Um, oh shit, sorry. So you've obviously got like explosive, you know, 100 meter dash, ice hockey, tennis, squash, boxing. Exercise is gonna be somewhere in the middle here where you're using oxygen and you're obviously using carbs, source of energy. Um, so fueling becomes important. You are looking at your body performing rather than looking at it from a, I'm only here because I wanna strip body fat off. Okay, if, you should not go into that mentality. See, if you want to lose weight, you should not go in with that mentality to the gym. You're losing weight happens where? When you sleep. It happens outside the gym. It doesn't happen in the gym. In the gym is where you perform. It's where you have the most amount of energy to burn the most amount of calories that gives you that weight loss. If you come in and you haven't eaten anything or you're not eating, uh, you're tired or whatever it is, you're not gonna get the best results out of it. Uh, and basically, if you want to fuel, if you're looking to build muscle, you maybe are not eating enough. One of the things I usually recommend is, uh, I don't know if there's anybody here, but some of my meal guys, I usually recommend something like a, a Lucas 8 Sport while you train, right? Lucas 8 Sport has 140 calories, about 30 grams of carbohydrates, and that can help fuel your workout give you the electrolytes, the fluid that you need throughout your session. Um, and on average, if you're gonna train for longer than an hour, and I know we only do an hour, uh, you're looking at one gram of carbs per every minute of exercise. So 60 grams of carbs is basically for 60 minutes of exercise. So the other thing I would say with that is, if you train first thing in the morning, what meal is the most important? Why? What have you trained before breakfast? Yeah. So the example I always give to people is there's a term called Perry Workout Nutrition, P E R I. And say the average person eats, I'm going to say four times, right? We have breakfast, lunch, dinner, and we have a snack, right? But say I train first thing in the morning. The most important meal is this. And this, why? Yeah, so my dinner will fuel my workout for the next morning and my breakfast will help me recover from that workout, right? So when I'm looking at if I'm gonna lose weight, I'm looking at, do I, I'm gonna strip maybe some calories away from these two. Now there is a personal preference. You could just go, I'm not really a morning person, prefer to eat most of my calories in the evening. So you probably could have smaller meal, smaller meal, bigger meal, bigger meal. So you have a big meal before you go to bed. 
right? That could make you feel good because the effect that has on your sleep when your stomach is full is great, right? It helps you sleep better. Now, if I have somebody who trains in the evening, then obviously I need something that's going to fuel my workout. I'm going to need something that's going to help me recover from my workout. So then the importance of meals changes. So I maybe skip breakfast to have a bigger lunch or I maybe have my snack there and have a, a bigger, bigger meal. Okay, so just look at how can you optimize your training session so you can get the most out of it. And then obviously some health supplements, multivitamins, EPA and DHA is just omega-3s and fish oils, vitamin D, creatine, monohydrate, caffeine. These are all the most researched and proven, like conclusive beyond terms, done on uh, uh, not only rat studies, but on human studies. And then obviously some things that can make a difference, beta-aniline, citrine, malate, which are just basically like uh, lactate buffers. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's answer some of these questions. Any, any questions about those, folks? I know I sort of rabbit on. This, for anybody who's been here, that's a completely different talk to what I usually do. I tend to make it all fat loss. That was a wee bit more about just stopping gaps in terms of uh, nutrition. But uh, anything on that before I start getting into these questions? Not going to keep us too long. Uh, more energy? I think probably the way we look at more energy, calories, we look at that parry workout. So if you're looking to increase your energy, if you're eating a calorie deficit, obviously, yes, Gavin, no worries, that's going to affect your energy. See there, boys? So that's going to affect your energy. So then what we need to look at is what we looked at there. When do you have your meals? right? When do you have them and how much you put in there? I could also be eating 2,000 calories, but I could be eating low carb. Is that going to affect my energy? Of course. So we need to know what is going into this. It doesn't have to be an exact science. It doesn't have to be perfect. If you have a balanced meal where you have proteins and carbs at every meal, some healthy fats, you're pretty much on the, a winner, right? As long as you're still matching that. So for here, Look at when you train, when's the most important time, what's fueling your workout, and what's helping you recover from your workout. Okay. Uh, recovery, performance, and session. Who was that? Me. You? John, uh, do you feel like your energy dissipates or you feel tired or? Uh, just, yeah, towards the end of the workout. And what's your primary focus for exercise? Why, why are you training? Uh, because it helps me with everything else in life. Okay, so it's not a body composition thing? It's not as well. Yeah, and the reason why I ask that is because if you're wanting to build muscle, then it's a completely different context to, to wanting to lose weight, yeah. right? So if we're looking at that, I'm looking at when you eat your food throughout the whole day. So we'll look at what your calories are on. How can we fuel that session? Now you come in usually what about eight, nine? Yeah. Okay. Do you eat before you come in? No. So there's that's the simplest thing I would look at. I'm not saying give you something big. Yeah. We're either looking at what you eat before your session or what are you going to take during your session. And you can't really eat anything physical in terms of like, go ahead. The old schools used to be just have a banana, right? I would be looking at maybe having uh a parry like amino acids, or I'd be looking to have maybe for you something like a legacy at sport, a parry during your session. They're they're not really that high in calories, and they're enough to give you energy during the session. So I would recommend. Where do you shop? Uh, Tesco's little. Tesco. Tesco do like we four acetonic drinks for like nothing. I would say do that, and how we measure that is how we perform. So I had a a, a male athlete who was training for three hours a day. And what we looked at is eating before the session. And then I give him like a, an intra workout drink. So a drink to have while he trained, but which had carbs in it, glucose and energy. And we started off with like 30 grams. And it's like, how did you perform? Oh, I felt good today. Yeah, not as bad as it was. And then we increased it to 50 grams. Oh, yeah, I felt great during training the day. 
to the point where I got them up to 120 grams of carbs just sipping throughout a session. Because the longer you train, the more your energy just does that. And then if you're getting a pump on and you're training your arms and then you eat something physical, where's that blood going? It goes to your gut to digest the food and not to where you want it to go. Okay, so try that. I would say that would be the, the, the first thing to try for me. And then, because if you don't want to eat anything beforehand, then we need to have something during the session. If we can't, something before the session I'm a big fan of, maybe a, a protein shake, a couple of rice cakes, because that's, say a chocolate rice cake, it's about 10 grams of carbs. Two of them, it's not really heavy on the stomach. Really simple. Yeah. Depends on your session. Okay. Like if you, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and again, that would all come in the context of what you had the night before and what time you train and so forth. But I would recommend it because, the, like I was saying to you, I look at training as this is my time to perform, not my time to lose weight. My time to lose weight comes at the end of the night when my body calculates all those calories I burned. Do you know what I mean? You don't want to be going, oh, I can't do it anymore. Okay. So yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan of feeling your workout more than thinking, I want to lose weight. And I know that's a hard thing because that's what, what the end goal is or the body composition goal. But if you're feeling your work and you're getting stronger, your body shape is going to change drastically. Uh, recovery, weight loss, cheat day. Who was asking for the cheat day? Yeah, um, that's what tends to happen. You, like, you especially, Connor, you can eat like a low calorie throughout the week, but you're, because you're eating at the weekend goes way higher, you're actually eating more than you probably think, and that's what it is. So whatever way you want to slice and dice your food or your energy, if you want to eat more in the weekends, like I, I prefer to eat the majority of my food at night, right? Because I enjoy sitting down, having something, and then if you're noticing that you're eating a lot of chocolate and junk at night, what I would do is I'd maybe tell you to push your meal timings back, try and push your dinner a little bit later, maybe fast for an hour or two in the morning so you can get through so that you eat a big meal and you don't feel like you want to eat chocolate and sweets. But yeah, if you're under eating there, you're going to overeat somewhere. And like, see as a coach, see if somebody comes to me and they're not losing weight and they're, you know, they're binging occasionally, I know they're not eating enough. Like it's a really simple fix. You're not eating enough. Oh no, 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 I am. It's like, I'm, like, I'm not hungry. You're not hungry, but you're binging consistently. That's an indication that you're under eating. Do you know what I mean? And then you can look at, somebody could be eating 1,500 calories Monday to Friday and then 3,000 on the weekends. So sometimes you, as a coach, we can go a couple of ways. We can go, let's increase those, let's decrease, let's level them out. Uh, and cheat day, that was always a big thing. Because of the transformation you did previous and the way that that was taught, you had that Saturday was a cheat day. Um, that's become ingrained in a lot of people. So, for example, if you've done a transformation and you were allowed a cheat meal or a cheat day on a Saturday, or say one day on a Sunday, uh, you'll favor that approach. And there's nothing wrong with it. Well, I say there's nothing wrong to it until it doesn't work. <laughs> um, and then we've got a problem. So you could do, and, and basically what that means, sorry folks, is say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you have this big massive day and these other days are just low. So you're basically going, I'm going to make up for the lowness for the rest of this week, which is a great thing of increasing your motivation, maybe keeping you on speed. But for some people, it can completely knock you off. And the reason why is if you have all those junk foods that you want, it's really hard to then get back on the bandwagon the next day. So you got to be aware of that. And that comes down to person dependent. Some people can do that. I had a female client um, who had lost a lot of weight, had stopped, put the weight on, and she'd done this cycle with us where she would stop for six months or a year and then come back. Um, and so I said to her, she was a, an all or nothing person. She ate super clean, super healthy, all the right things, or she didn't do any of it. She didn't exercise, didn't think. So I says, why don't we try something that's a little bit more flexible? I'll, you know, what's your favorite breakfast, your favorite lunch, your favorite dinner? Put it into a meal plan for her. What's your favorite, like, 
biscuit or treat and I think it was like say a chocolate digestive uh, or Jaffa cake whatever it was and I put it in that she could have two of them you know a couple of times a week with a cup of tea and two weeks in she went you need to take them out of my diet I says why what's wrong she went I can't stop at two right and you may think that's funny <laughs> it is to agree but in my head I was going if I give her something she could have a wee bit of something it's great it's going to help her long term but it wasn't at the start. We needed to get her to that stage where she can have flexibility. Um, so some people need to have that more than, than others. Um, macros, proteins, portions. Uh, anything in particular you want to know about that? or? Yeah, no worries. Yeah, starving. Yeah. Okay. Well, then what I would say is up it. What, the yeah. Because it's an experiment. I want you to think of your body as an experiment. Like you're trying to figure out the Goldilocks effect, which is what porridge is the best porridge for you. So if you're finding that you're lacking in energy or you're going home and you're starving, right? That, you've burnt through a shit ton of calories. You want to replace them really, really quickly. So we'll be looking at what you'd be having before, during, and after. Okay, so try that. Always, anything you change something, test one thing. Don't be going out. Because if I said to you, work your ass off, eat like a monk, do loads of cardio, and you lose weight, and that's what you wanted, you don't know what it was that, that got you to lose the weight. Do you know what I mean? Uh, Support networks, I think that's a boundary issue. That's something you need to speak to friends, family. Um, big one is environment, see you there. Um, choosing, choosing the people, see you later. We use our in and around. Uh, veggies, we covered a wee bit. Volume eating, starving, binge, fasting, training. What's that, taming while busy, working health. Any, anything else or anything I haven't covered? Yeah. Um, if there's anything that you want more information on, I'll send it to you for a wee bit of further reading. Try and break it down that it's easier because it obviously becomes very generalized because we're covering loads of things. But the biggest, see apart from all this, the biggest issues you use or all want to have is motivation. Motivation and adherence, right? And that's where it needs to be super clear of what it is that you want because then it makes it easier for me and Steve and the rest of the team to go, here's what you need to do. But if you're struggling and you're trying to do 10 things at once, you're trying to get this perfect you know, body composition while work is crazy, while family is crazy, like sometimes you gotta pick your battles. Like I sometimes say to people, see not putting on weight if you haven't trained or you've got shit going on, it's a fucking win. Sometimes you gotta choose those wins and go, listen, this just isn't a great time, but now, nah, next week, I'm going to go all in, okay? Because we see it, some of you guys have done like the six-week Christmas shred and everybody gets super motivated because there's this, right? You know, you've got this set time and period. In between, you may have a little lull where you're just focusing on getting stronger or getting fitter. I know it's not nice because we all want to see a return of investment, uh, but sometimes the best thing is not getting worse. You know what I mean? Anything else? Thank you. No? Guys, appreciate it. Safe home. Thank you, mate. Um, hopefully, if anybody needs a lift, let me know. <laughs>